I'll cover uh, different layers of UCI focusing on, on, on the protocol stack. Uh, my name is Fadesh Chaudhary. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the protocol working group uh, at UCI and an IO architect at Intel. So today we'll sort of do a deeper dive into the protocol layer as well as the die to die adapter functionality. And towards the end, I'll very quickly give a, a high level overview of the physical layer, the logical physical layer. Uh, the electrical aspects and the form factor side of it, Joe will cover in the, in the next session. So as uh, Debendra covered before, UCIE is a, a layered um, you know, stack. And we've defined you know, well-defined functionality for each of the layers. So we start with the protocol layer, which is at the top of the stack. Then we have a defined interface called FTI, which is the flit aware die to die interface um, that talks to the die to die adapter. And then the adapter's responsibilities are things like CRC retry, link state management, protocol negotiation. Um, and in the case of CXL, uh, it also does the RMUX functionality, which is defined in the CXL specification. And along with that, you know, it interfaces to the logical physical layer using a raw die to die interface. And um, you know, the physical layer takes care of things like link training, lane repair for advanced packages, lane reversal, scrambling, descrambling, um, sideband initialization training and, and transfers. And of course, it has the analog front end and the clock forwarding circuitry for, for the link. Now, one thing I'll mention, I'll refer to the interfaces throughout the talk. Um, we try to make it so that RDI is a, is a subset of the FDI interface. And Primarily, the reason for giving these interfaces, because it's an on-die chiplet stack, is to allow IP vendors to mix and match. So we should be able to take a physical layer from IP vendor A and a die to die adapter from IP vendor B, and they should interop with each other as long as they're following the rules of the RDI interface. Similarly for the FDI interface. And you know, a lot of the functionality that turns around you know, link state management, error notifications, things like that, We've kept it common across the interfaces, so they end up being sort of, um, you know, FDI becomes a superset of RDI. Of course, FDI interfacing to the protocol layer has some, um, you know, pins on it to identify, you know, which protocol was negotiated, what was the flip format for that protocol, and things like that. And I sort of wanted to give a quick summary of that before we got into this, because I won't have time to cover the details of the interfaces in the talk today, but I'll be referencing them um, you know, across as we talk through the different layers. So just so people have an idea of, you know, um, what's going on over there. In terms of protocols that we support, um, as they've been covered as well, we cover PCIe and CXL. And then along with that, we have a streaming protocol, which is a vendor defined protocol. We'll talk a lot more about, you know, the different flip formats and the feature set for all the protocols. And, um, I'll also go over like a summary table so that it's clear in terms of you know the matrix of protocol versus the different flip formats we support. And then because it's a die to die link, we need a much, you know, the BER rate is so much better than off package interconnects that we can get away with a 16 bit CRC only. Um, and that enables us to have certain optimized flip formats where we can get higher efficiency of packing from the protocol layer's perspective. And so we'll cover some of those formats which will be unique to the UCIE stack, uh, but are sort of derived from the existing PCIe and CXO flit formats. And then the raw formats um, are, are essentially where the die to die adapter data path is bypassed. So the protocol layer takes care of link reliability, CRC, FEC, whatever may be required. Um, and that becomes very useful for things like retimers, where you're trying to get through a die to die link eventually to an off package interconnect and the protocol layer might need stronger CRC and FEC uh, to deal with that off package interconnect. It's also useful for cases where you just want to send like a raw um, sort of uh, set of wires across. Um, you know, you'd see that many people might want to disaggregate their die and they just want to take their internal fabric and sort of break it into two. Raw format could be used for things like that as well. So there's no flit format associated with the particular raw format. It's essentially up to the protocol layer uh, to define that and, and operate uh, with the remote link partner. 
All right, so we'll start with PCIe non-flip mode and CXL 68-byte flip mode. Now, people familiar with PCIe will know that up until PCIe 5.0 specification, we had um, you know, not a flit-based protocol, but a transaction layer packet-based framing. And so that's what we refer to as the non-flit mode for PCIe. And then people familiar with CXL will know that up until CXL 2.0, CXL had a 68-byte flit format, um, which was used for speeds up to 32 gigatransfers per second onto the off-packet SIRDES link. So we've mapped both of these uh, formats and protocols onto UCIE. Um, the unique thing we did here is for PCIe non-flit mode, in the interest of trying to keep, you know, logic uh, overhead small, as well as make the transition easier for people to go from PCIe CXL transaction layers to a UCIE stack, we are leveraging the 68-byte flit formats for both of these protocols um, when they are being sent over UCIE. And what happens there is, for these split formats, they look very similar to what's defined in the CXL specification, but the retry CRC portion of it is taken care um, by the Dieter adapter, and the framing that we follow essentially follows the CXL.io framing uh, for the 68-byte split. And so the you know packing, unpacking rules, all of those are leveraged from the CXL specification. And because they were close enough um, from a sort of PCIe by 16 framing point of view, um, the idea is that the transition from that to this fixed lit format size makes things easier, and you don't have to have like a separate mode for PCI non-flit mode in terms of the link transport. Um, you can leverage the CXL 68-byte flit format um, as is. Now, because the retry and CRC is taken care of by the die to die adapter, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the PCIe-defined ACNAC DLLPs are not relevant, and so those are not used when, when we are talking about UCIE. And you'll see that consistently across uh, all the flit formats. Um, you know, we are leveraging the PCIe 6.0 retry mechanisms, which don't rely on the ACNAC DLLPs. They have the sequence number and, and the ACNAC commands embedded in a flit header, and we'll talk more about that when we cover it in the adapter section. In addition, um, the interesting thing about UCIE that we don't have um, in off-packet studies is there is a dedicated sideband link. And so we can use that sideband link for all of the link management and negotiation kind of capabilities. Things like power management. Um, things like even you should want to retrain the link. Um, and what this does is that it separates that away from the main band data path. So you don't have any of that overhead uh, for the regular uh, data path where you want high performance. And a lot of this management stuff, we can move it over to sideband. And because we're doing that, UCI defines its own sideband protocol and packets to do these negotiations across the sideband. And so we don't use the PM DLLPs uh, for these negotiations that are defined in PCI CXL. Um, so th those are some of the main um, differences between what you would see in the PCI spec and then how we end up mapping it to UCI. And then again, because the retry CRC is inserted by, you know, uh, the CRC is inserted by the adapter, it's a different CRC than what PCIe has. The link CRC, the DLLP CRC are driven to zero uh, from a transmitter perspective uh, from coming from the protocol layer. And then things inside the um, STP token, the sequence number frame CRC, all of those are driven to zero by the transmitter as well because all of that's taken care of by the adapter. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the adapter section. In terms of how the protocol layer drives packets on the FDI interface, um, recall that FDI interface is what it's using to interface to the die to die adapter. The protocol layer just gives a 64 byte of the flit, um, which has the protocol information in it. And then the adapter inserts two bytes of a flit header and then two bytes of CRC. And it does the rele you know, relevant byte shifting that's required. And then you know, for CXL, the adapter also has the ARMUX functionality um, to, to handle the VLSM state transitions and so on. Now, one thing we wanted to be cognizant of is really encourage people uh, to make area and power efficient designs for the UCI stack, um, as well as sort of make it easy for them to transition from existing uh, PCI CXL stacks to UCI stacks. And so 
you know, because it's a die-to-die -die link, it has a forwarded clock, there's no 8B, 10B encoding, there's no 128B, 130B encoding, um, and we've strongly recommended people to optimize all of that logic away from their stacks, you know, tie things off to zero, um, so that when, when they build a design for UCI stack, it has, uh, you know, it doesn't have any of that overhead and it's sort of truly optimized in terms of area and power for a die-to-die -die link. Now, PCI 6.0 onwards, uh, it introduced a flit mode where it was a 256 byte flit. Um, I'll go over the flit formats in a lot more detail in the adapter section. Um, but we support that in UCI as well. And again, within this protocol mode, we have support for raw mode. So you could take the PCI flit as is and send it across the die-to-die -die link in raw mode. Um, or you can have it as a UCI standard mode where the retry and CRC will be taken over by the die-to-die -die adapter. And again, the framing would follow the PCI defined framing. Um, and you know, the PM and link management DLLPs are not used for the same reason that I mentioned before, because we have a sideband link to do that negotiation. And then um, recall that in PCIe, the flow control DLLPs don't go through the retry buffer. And so we've plumped for that on FDI, where those DLLPs are sent separately on the interface, and then the adapter takes them and inserts it in the right position in the flit. Um, you know, uh, so that it doesn't go through the retry buffer. Similarly, uh, CXL 3.0 defined a 256 byte flit for both CXL or IO and CXL or cache mem. Both of those are supported um, as standard flits in UCIE. We also support the latency optimized flits uh, defined in CXL 3.0, where the the flit granularity or the uh, you know CRC is over 128 bytes not over the entire 256 bytes. And we, we'll cover a lot about that um, as we get to the adapter section. And similar to all of the other protocols, you can run this in raw mode, or you can leverage the retry and CRC from the die-to-die -die adapter uh, to take advantage of the UCIe stack. And again, just like PCIe for CXL.io, we send the flow control DLLP separately on FDI, and then the adapter inserts it into the flit at the right position. And um, in all of the CXL modes, the ARBMUX functionality is uh, sort of within the die-to-die -die adapter if you're using the uh, standard 256 byte flit modes. If you're running it in raw mode, then the ARBMUX functionality is up to the protocol there. And then for streaming protocol, in UCI 1.0, we support it only in raw mode, so all of the interop with the remote link partner you know, the flit definition, all of that is up to, up to the protocol there to define. Um, and and uh, from a UCI perspective, we give it, uh, you know, all of the negotiation, link management uh, properties, but the data path transfer is up to the protocol there to handle. So now we'll go a little bit more over uh, the die-to-die -die adapter. And this is where we sort of spend uh, most of our time during the session. Um, I want to cover things like, you know, what is the functionality partitioning, um, certain example configurations. We'll spend quite a bit of time in the flit format details, where I'll talk about certain optimized flit formats that UCIE has defined. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we'll give a matrix, uh, so that's easier to summarize, you know, which protocols support which flit formats, what's mandatory and what's optional. And then I'll talk a little bit about the state machine hierarchy, because Given that we have multiple layers in the protocol, when we are doing things like power management or error escalations and things like that, um, we want to have a well-defined flow so that the different layers can sort of talk to each other in a consistent way. And so we've built a state machine hierarchy to sort of go in and out of power management for deeper levels of power management. So the equivalent of L1 and L2 in PCIe is also supported in UCIe, um, in addition to the dynamic clock gating that that Debender had covered earlier. And so to support all of those, we have a state machine hierarchy that, that I'll talk over. And then I'll give a couple of examples of you know, parameter exchanges and the power management flow um, uh, example for, for the adapter in, in the context of CXL. So with respect to the functionality partitioning, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for CXL, the ARBMUX is sort of inside the die to die adapter. So all of that functionality is taken over uh, by the adapter. We have a very lightweight CRC computation. 
Like I mentioned, it's a 16-bit CRC that guarantees a uh, triple-bit uh, detection. Um, and uh, we've sort of uh, have run it through the ropes to make sure that it converges at very high frequencies and it can be pipelined and those kind of things um, as well. So it's, it's a low overhead logic that gives us very robust uh, error detection. And then any CRC failure will trigger a flip replay mechanism. And here we've leveraged it from the PCI flip mode, but we've done some simplifications so that we don't have to um, sort of take all of the complexity of an off-packet SIRDES link over here. Because it's a die-to-die -die link, our round trip latencies are so small, you know, two, three nanoseconds in one direction. So from a retry, retry mechanism, the main simplification we've done is we've omitted the selective NAC, uh, pro, you know, uh, feature in, in PCIe. So any any replay error triggers a full replay, but because our our link latencies are so low, the overhead of that, and and you know, along with the probability of an error is so low that the overhead of that really doesn't factor in. And even with a typical link, like you might see a retry once in several hours, is is what the probability works out to. So really, the the link itself is is so robust that we've kept the simplest retry mechanism uh, that we need for such a link. In addition, the die-to-die -die adapter does uh, link state management, like I mentioned. So, you know, we have defined flows for transitioning or bring the link up from reset state to active, um, entering and exiting power management flows, uh, different error uh, escalation, things like link disable, link reset. Uh, one of the things that, that Nathan's going to cover later is, is the software aspect of it. And we've taken a lot of care to, to ensure that legacy PCI and CXL software can seamlessly transition to a UCI stack and, and the link uh, still, still looks to software like a traditional PCI link. So in terms of like a link management perspective, similar kind of hooks of you know, doing link disable and things like that are, are provided. And, and then we've given you know, mechanisms on how, how to implement that so that uh, the porting over to software is, porting over software to UCI links is much easier as well. And then uh, finally, one of the things, because we support so many protocols and so many different modes, um, in the interest of interoperability, you have to be able to negotiate uh, with the remote link partner what is the mode and flit format you're going to operate in. So the way that works is we define for every protocol at least one mandatory flit format and then a bunch of optional formats to, that give you different levels of link efficiency. And it's the role of the adapter to negotiate that with the link uh, partner along with other protocol features. And I'll give one example of that in the context of CXL as you go along. All right, so now let's look at some of the example configurations here. So what I have in the first picture is a single protocol layer that's talking to a data -to adapter. Um, just in the interest of space, I haven't shown the physical layer, so it's just showing the FDI and the RTI interfaces. But the idea is that you could have a single protocol layer, which could be PCI or streaming, that's talking to a die to die adapter, and then with the remote link partner, it'll train up either in PCI or streaming mode, whichever uh, one it supports. You could also have a single CXL stack, um, where you actually have two protocol layers, one for CXL.io, one for CXL.cachemem. Of course, the, you know, the transaction layer definition of those protocols follows the CXL specification, but like I mentioned, the adapter takes over things like ARPMUX functionality and uh, uh, flit CRC and retry uh, uh, functionality. Now, because we have so much bandwidth on the die-to-die -die link, we wanted to allow um, easier transitions of people building PCIe and CXL stacks today that may be of a lower bandwidth cap. So what you can do is you can have two sets of protocol layers talk to the die-to-die -die adapter to take full advantage of the higher die-to-die -die link bandwidth, but tunnel multiple protocol stacks on the same physical link. And that's really, so one example of that could be, you could, you could take like two Gen 5 capable protocol layer stacks, but hook them up to an adapter that's talking on the link that's capable of a Gen 6 data rate. And we've defined that functionality. Um, what happens is the die-to-die -die adapter implements a stack mux and there is a bit in the flit header that says which protocol layer that flit belongs to. And then we have certain restrictions on how 
you know, one protocol layer cannot insert back-to-back -back flits, so that on the receiver side, you're not going to overflow its buffers, you're still going to get an effective Gen 5 or, you know, whatever bandwidth you've designed it to. And so this, this was really one of those things of, you know, we have, you know, as we are waiting for people to transition their silicon designs to much higher bandwidths, um, it's a lot easier for them to take existing designs and map them to UCI stack, making minor uh, changes, uh, but, but still be able to leverage the higher die-to-die -die link bandwidth. So it gives you, you know, show line efficiency, power efficiency, all of that stuff when you're trying to do things like that. And of course, it helps time to market. All right, so now let's go through uh, the different formats that are supported in the, in the adapter. We'll start with the raw format, which is, like I said, you know, effectively bypassing the entire data path of the data adapter. Um, one thing I'll say that all of the examples that I'll show of the flit formats, we're assuming a 64 byte data path uh, width on the FDI. So you'll see even for a 256 byte flit, it'll show up as four chunks of 64 bytes, um, just because that's a granularity we picked for showing the examples of the flit formats. In the case of raw format though, um, because everything is inserted by the protocol layer, the adapter has no idea what is the flit boundary or any, anything of that nature. Everything is controlled by the protocol layer, and so it just takes all of the 64 bytes that come in the FDI and then it forwards it to RDI um, without any modifications or additions. And so this format is supported for uh, all protocols, but it's mandatory for uh, the die-to-die -die adapters that support streaming protocol because that's the only mode um, that we support for streaming in UCI 1.0, uh, uh, that becomes uh, a mandatory mode for the adapter functionality if it has to support streaming protocols. So the next format uh, that we'll cover um, is the 68-byte flip format. Now, this one, like I mentioned, is leverage from the CXL 68-byte flip format. And so what's happening here is that we're getting 64 bytes of the flit from the protocol layer on FDI. And the adapter is inserting four additional bytes per flit. So it inserts two bytes of a flit header and then a two byte CRC. And because it's inserting additional uh, bytes in the flit, but the RDI interface is still going to be 64 bytes, it has to do certain byte shifting um, to transport it over RDI. And that, that byte shifting is also uh, this, you know, taken care of by the adapter. Now the CRC covers the two byte flit header as well as all of the bytes that are inserted by the protocol layer. And the flit header that's inserted by the adapter carries things like the protocol identifier. So in the case of CXL, it would have uh, two bits that say whether it's CXL.io, whether it's a CXL.cachemem flit, or whether it's a RMUX flit, or if it's just an adapter no op flit. In addition to that, there is a stack identifier. This is relevant for that configuration where I showed there's multiple sets of protocol layers that are using the same die to die adapter. So there's one bit of a stack identifier that says, you know, if you're using two stacks of protocol layer, which one does it correspond to? Then there is an 8-bit sequence number, and then there's a 2-bit opcode that says whether it's an ACK NAC, uh, uh for, for that particular sequence number. And then finally, there is something called a pause of data stream uh, indication. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. Um, but the main reason we have the pause of data stream indication is because, as you can see, the ending of a flit doesn't line up with a 64-byte boundary. So normally, what ends up happening is because you're transmitting this, let's take an example of one 64-lane advanced package module, right? The way the transfer is set up on the physical layer is each lane is transmitting in a granularity of byte. So in a particular transfer, you will send 64 bytes across to the remote link partner. Now, if you have to take advantage of you know, shutting down and bringing back up the physical layer to get active dynamic power savings. You want to end at a 64 byte boundary. But because here it ends up being a 68 byte flit, and you only have, let's say, one flit to send, 
you're not going to end up at a 64 byte align boundary. So how do you tell the remote link partner that you are going to stop your data stream now so that you can pick it back up at a predefined boundary? Because if you don't do that, the remote link partner is going to try to interpret the next split and then it'll see a CRC error and then it'll trigger a retry flow and you could perpetually be in that cycle without ever coming out of it. So in order to notify the remote link partner that, you know, hey, I'm done with my flit transfer, I'm going to shut off my data stream, we, we have a pause of data stream indication that's unique um, from a 68 byte split format perspective and the main reason for that is because, um, you know, it's, it's not a granularity of 64 bytes, so it doesn't line up with always the last lane um, for the transfer of, of, you know, flit. And rather than keep sending flits until you hit a 64 byte granularity, that could take a lot of power if you just had like very lightly loaded applications. Um, it's, it's more efficient to just have an indication to tell the remote link partner that, hey, my data stream is pausing and, and I'm going to shut off sending additional package to you. So what we do that is, how, you know, we have an indication in the flit header that follows uh, the last flit that says this is a pause of data stream flit header. And a few things have to happen when we're going down this route. Um, like I mentioned, you know, the, the remote link partner's receiver will see that flit header and know a pause of data stream is coming, but it also needs some time to react to that and reset its barrel shifting because the next time flits pick up, they're gonna start from byte position zero on the link. So the way we do that is we give an indication in the flit header that says this is a pause of data stream, and then we sort of always align our transfers to 256 byte chunks, and then we ensure that there's at least a couple of uh, 64 byte chunks of all zero data, just to give enough time for the remote link partner to uh, reset his barrel shifter and get ready for a fresh uh, data stream. And that's what's shown here. So what's shown in the picture is there's a single flit that's transmitted, which ends up you know, at the 68 byte boundary and then followed, following that is a, is a PDS flit header. We end that chunk of 64 with all zero and then we add a couple of additional chunks of 64 bytes uh, of all zero data. And that gives enough time for the remote link partner's receiver to uh, detect that a positive data stream has happened, reset its battle shifter and get ready for a fresh stream. Now we don't have this problem in any of the other flit formats because they are already at 256 byte granularity. And so they'll always end at a multiple of, um, you know, the, the lane counts of the different configurations that we have. So there's no pause of data stream necessary for any of those. You can transfer one flit at a time and then shut off your data stream. Um, the receiver basically knows the next flit will always start at lane zero byte zero. So this third format that we'll cover here is shown um, over here, it's just the standard PCIe flit mode uh, uh, flit format. We call it a standard 256 byte end header flit format uh, because the flit header in this format appears towards the end of the flit. But effectively, this is the same flit format that's defined in the PCIe 6.0 specification with a couple of minor differences. The main one being that the CRC and FEC bytes are not entirely used up. Because for a die to die link, we have a 16 bit CRC, and that 16 bit CRC is always computed over um, you know, 128 bytes for this split format. You will see two sets of CRC here one set for the first 128 byte half, and then one set for the second 128 byte half. But we only need to use four bytes of the CRC. People recall in the, in the PCIe standard, there is eight bytes of CRC and then six bytes of FEC. So out of those 14 bytes, we're only using four bytes uh, for link reliability on, on the die to die link. And so the remaining 10 bytes are marked as reserved for the split format. Now, in terms of the transfer over FDI, the protocol layer sends this flit um, in, in, in a similar format over FDI, but it drives zero over the reserved bits as well as the bits that are meant to be filled by the adapter. So the flit header, um, if the DLP was carrying DLLPs 
as well as the CRC bytes and the reserved bytes would be marked as zero by the protocol layer. But it is free to fill in all of the bytes that are dedicated for the protocol layer. And then like I mentioned earlier, the flow control DLLPs are sent separately uh, in parallel across a dedicated interface over FDI. And then the adapter takes that and inserts it to the relevant DLP byte positions uh, for the flits that, that carry it. Um, and those will be the flits that don't have a flit marker present. And, and if a flit marker is present, that's inserted by the protocol layer for this flit format because that's associated with the TLPs uh, that, are, that are in the flit. So similarly, um, you know, we supported two standard 256 byte start header flit format. Uh, again, we call it start header flit format because here the flit header is in the beginning. Uh, but people familiar with CXL will see that this is pretty much the same flit format that's defined in CXL 3.0 for CXL.io and CXL.cachemem. And uh, I've shown both the versions. The main difference between cachemem and .io is that .io has the DLP bytes, uh, which can carry a flit marker or DLLP. And so that part remains the same as PCIe. Uh, the flit header has moved to the beginning. That helps the receiver uh, figure out which protocol the flit belongs to and steer it in the right way without having to do store and forward. And then just like in the previous flit format, we have two sets of CRC, um, each set having two bytes uh, and, and each set corresponding to 128 bytes uh, of the flit. So CRC zero corresponds to the first 128 bytes, CRC one corresponds to the second 128 byte chunk. And uh, like I mentioned for CXL.io, it's similar to PCIe, so the flit marker would be populated by the protocol layer, um, but the DLLPs would be sent over separate signals and the adapter fills those in into the DLP bytes if the flit marker is not present. And then for cache mem, there are no DLP bytes, so the corresponding bytes are used for payload um, as in the CXL specification. And so this flit format follows the same framing rules um, for the standard flit in the CXL specification. All right, now CXL 3.0 also had latency optimized flits defined. Um, and we have two flavors of those in UCIE. And uh, you know, the first one that's shown here is basically the same as what the CXL spec defines, uh, with, with the exception that for the CRC bytes, uh, you know, there's six byte of CRC per 128 bytes in the CXL specification and then six bytes of FEC that show up in the end, these are replaced by the two sets of 16-bit uh, CRCs that we have for data dialings. So what you'll see, you know, the cache mem is a good representation of this is, instead of the last six bytes being CRC, there's four bytes of reserved, uh, uh, and, and, and then two bytes of the CRC corresponding to that flit half. And then towards the end, instead of FEC plus CRC bytes, you see 10 bytes are reserved and two bytes of CRC for that flit half. The other difference that shows up here is in the CXL.io flit format. And what we've done here is we've allowed the capability to send a DLP byte in the first flit half and then give dedicated space uh, for the flit marker in the second flit half. Just because we had those bytes as reserved, uh, we, we sort of split it over the two uh, flit halves over there. Other than that, the, the packing rules are the same as defined in, in CXL. Um, again, the DLLPs are sent to zero or separate signals on FDI. Um, and instead of the DLLP, instead of the DLLP, there is just regular payload information for CXL.catchman. So this one looks very similar uh, to the latency optimized split that we have in the CXL 3.0 specification. But because we expect a lot of applications over the die-to-die -die link would be even more sensitive to latency as well as link efficiency. We went one step further for this format and um, we sort of increased the link efficiency by sort of using the reserved bytes here for additional payload information. So that's shown in the, in, in the next format here. So what's happening here is that um, Basically, instead of having the bytes uh, be reserved, we've created dedicated space for payload information in those. And it looks slightly different between 
cxl.cache, uh, cxl.cache.mem and cxl.io. For cxl.cache.mem, it was convenient that there were 14 bytes of reserved. So if I go back to the previous format, you can see there's four bytes of reserved in the first half and 10 bytes of reserved uh, information in the second half. We can take those 14 bytes and effectively have another edge slot space, which is a 14 byte slot for cxl.cache.mem. So what ends up happening is that the rest of the flit follows the same packing rules as cxl.cache.mem, but it has space to insert an additional edge slot of 14 bytes in this flit format. So when this flit format is negotiated, the receiver need, is, is aware to expect you know, an extra edge slot coming in as part of this flit. And of course, if it has nothing to send, that slot can be empty. But you know, utilizing those additional 14 bytes gives us a good bump in link efficiency. Um, and and you know, because these are latency optimized splits, we wanted to encourage that in UCIE. For .io, um, we kept it a you know just an extension of the second half of the flit to use an additional D word of information that can be inserted. Now, because in the .io protocol, the TLPs are in you know, D-word granularity, um, we didn't want to give uh, additional overhead to the protocol layer to do like non-D-word level byte shifting. So we just extended the second half of the chunk to have an additional D-word of payload from the protocol layer. So if you look at the .io flit and see the difference between the previous one, where six bytes were reserved, to this one, there's only two bytes reserved, the second half of the, ch of, of the flit, has an additional D word or four bytes of payload that the protocol layer can insert. And so it gets you know, that, that little bit of efficiency bump from a CXL.io protocol format. And um, the rest of it, the DLP bytes, the flit marker, the flit header definitions, all of those follow the same uh, rules as I mentioned for the previous flit format. And you know, sending over FDI because these are 256 byte flits, protocol layer will send the flit o, you know, as is, but it'll drive zero, bit, zero on the bits that are to be filled in by the die to die adapter, as well as the reserved, any of the reserved bits. All right, so what's shown here is a um, summary of essentially the matrix of the protocol and the flit format. So I'll walk through this so that it sort of makes sense. Um, you know, each each column corresponds to uh, a flit format name or a protocol. So you would see we covered the PCI non-flit mode, we covered PCI flit mode, we covered CXL 68 byte flit mode, and then CXL 256 byte flit mode protocols. So uh, we sort of referring to a protocol, we call them as you know, X flit mode. Um, and that's used to refer to the protocol related features that are defined in the corresponding specification. So the CXL 256 byte flit mode covers all of the protocol features that would be defined in the CXL specification for 256 byte flits. And then the PCI flit mode covers all of the protocol features that are defined in the PCI specification for 256 byte flits. And then for the transport mechanism over the die to die link, uh, each row is corresponding to the flit format um, that, that we've, we've just covered, right? So it starts with the raw format, then there is the 68 byte format, then there is the standard 256 byte end header format, which if you recall was similar to the PCIe format. Then there is the standard 256 byte start header format, which is similar to the CXL standard flit definition. And then we had the two flavors of the latency optimized flit. Uh, with our optional bytes is closer to what the CXL specification defined. And with optional bytes um, is the additional efficiency bump and that, that we've defined in UCIE. And so that's why you see sort of the six rows of flit formats and then each of the column is showing uh, the protocol. And then in a specific cell, for that row and that column, we are saying whether it's optional or mandatory or whether it's not applicable. So the raw format is optional for all of the protocols except for streaming. And again, the, the streaming protocol 
really here is referring to the die to die adapter because the protocol layer level interoperation is is going to be vendor defined um, based on which is you know which protocol you're carrying over and then so for that one the raw mode is mandatory but everything else is not applicable now for other protocols if you took at PCI non flip mode the raw format becomes optional for all of the others but for PCI non flip mode the only mapping we had was the 68 byte flip format and this is where we were saying we're leveraging the CXL.io uh, framing and packing and packing uh, for the PCI non flip mode transfer as well and so the other flip formats are not applicable for that protocol for PCI flip mode the Standard 256 byte end header is the mandatory one, and the other flip formats become not applicable. That's the one um, that we went over that's defined in the PCIe specification. For CXL 68 byte flip mode, similar to PCIe non flip mode, the 68 byte flip formats are mandatory, but the others are not applicable. And then for CXL 256 byte flip mode, um, you know, the standard 256 byte start header is the CXL format, so that's mandatory. Similar to the CXL specification, the latency optimized uh, flit formats that match the CXL specification are optional, but we've strongly recommended the latency optimized uh, flit formats with the optional bytes. And the idea there is that if, if you are investing in a die to die link, you want to get the best link efficiency and latency uh, possible especially when you're doing things like cxl.mem, every nanosecond or sub nanosecond of latency counts to your round trip latency of a memory read. And so we really want to encourage uh, IP vendors and designers to make full use of the latency optimized flit um, and take advantage of the additional efficiency boost that's given in the UCI specification. So that's why you'd see that one as a strongly recommended flit format for CXL. Um, when, when it comes to latency optimized splits. Next up, I um, want to cover a little bit about the state machine hierarchy. Now, like I mentioned, this is sort of shifting gears a little bit, uh, but because we have a layered stack um, and we are doing a lot of the link management stuff, supporting things like L1 and L2, error flows, um, even the software semantics of disabling links and so on. Um, we want a well-defined state machine hierarchy um, that also uh, lends us to interop between the die to die adapter and the physical layer. Um, like I mentioned, we expect um, you know physical layer from one IP vendor to interop with the die to die adapter from a different IP vendor, and a part of that is you know well-defined state machines for the interface. Um, that that are um, sort of dictating, you know, what state the link is in. Is it operating in a normal or a low power state? Is it sending data transfers or not? So, for the context of the adapter, um, you know, there is a couple of things that come into play. For CXL, the virtual link state machine that's defined in the CXL specification, that's the one that's exposed to FDI. And this is because the RMUX functionality is taken over by the die to die adapter. So from a protocol layer perspective, just like in CXL, it just sees the virtual link state machine when talking to a die to die adapter. And again, this is part of making it easier for people to transition over from their existing CXL protocol layer stacks to a die to die stack. For PCIe or streaming, um, we have an adapter link state machine, uh, which is sort of coordinating the physical link state with um, that, that it sees on RDI with the upper layer, um, the protocol layer. And so that adapter link state machine is what's exposed on FDI. And in the case of CXL, what happens is that, um, you know, there is a RMUX boundary within the adapter that takes care of the transition of the adapter link state machine uh, to the VLSMs. And the the reason for them being separate is that we want to make sure that the flows and the negotiation that we define for the adapter link state machine work across all protocols. And for those, we're using sideband handshakes to uh, sort of uh, deal with the different state transitions. 
when it comes to CXL, we want to keep that um, for you know interfacing with the remote link partner. But then the translation to the VLSM, we sort of leverage the RMUX flows from CXL specification. So those VLSMs um, are showing up independently for CXL. And they use the RMUX link layer management packets for uh, you know, dealing with the VLSM transitions. And so those are the ALMPs that, that we are referring to here. And then like I mentioned, the adapter link state management handshakes um, are, are done over sideband link. We don't have a lot of time to get into the details of the sideband protocol, but there's well-defined sideband you know, packet formats and messages, uh, both from a adapter link state management point of view, as well as things like register accesses, um, parameter negotiations for the different protocols, even link training uh, from a physical perspective is coordinated using the sideband, uh, sideband link. I want to give a little flavor of a typical link initialization flow. Now, because you know these are um, a die-to-die -die link, different chiplets may have their own reset flow and bring up to get to a point where they're ready to train the link up in the first place. So before we even do anything on the link, we have to wait for each of the dies to independently finish their own internal reset flow and get to a point where they're ready to <coughs> train the link. This could be things like you know their internal sort of patch download, fuse download, all of those things can happen in the blue box shown here. And they can take different amount of time for each chiplet, depending on how that's being done inside the package. But once we are ready to, to train the UCIE link, there's three um, well-defined uh, sort of uh, partitioning or, or segments of the link bring up flow. The first stage, we just detect and initialize the sideband interface. Like I mentioned in the previous side, the sideband interface is critical for all of the negotiation that we do during link training, parameter exchanges, as well as link management. So the stage one, we have to make sure that the sideband link is up and it's, it's, it's uh, initialized and it's ready to operate. So that what, that's what happens in the first part. That's taken care of completely by the physical layer. The adapter and the protocol layer don't really need to know what's happening over there until the link has come up to a state where they are ready to, to operate that's abstracted away from them and the physical layer negotiates with the remote link partner to make sure sideband is up and running. Once the sideband is, is ready to go, we go through um, the entire link training flow. I'll cover that a little bit in the physical layer section. Um, you know, but, but basically things like lane repair, if applicable for advanced packages, lane reversal, all of those things are, are enabled and configured during this part of the flow. Effectively, the link state machine uh, in the physical layer is getting to a point where it's it's getting ready for the main band to to operate, and so it'll figure out you know what is the maximum speed I support versus my link partner, and sort of pick the highest common speed that they can interop in. Um, in in the case of standard package, there may be a width degrade because of lane failures. In the case of advanced package, there may be lane repair in case of failures. All of those things are being worked through different states in the link training state machine. And the orange box is sort of abstracting all of that away. And again, this is a physical layer to physical layer um, operation or negotiation. So the adapter and the protocol layer uh, really don't need to be involved in this part of the flow. That's all abstracted away at the RDI level. And the physical layer negotiates with the remote link partner using dedicated sideband messages for the physical layer. Once it gets to a point where a uh, physical layer knows that the main band is ready, uh, it's moved to an active state, and now regular flit transfer can begin. Um, it notifies that to the adapter over RDI, and the adapter then kicks in and first tries to figure out, hey, let me do protocol and parameter exchanges. So it needs to know what is the protocol I'm going to operate in. It needs to know what is the flit format it's going to operate in, and certain other configuration um, items to interrupt with the remote link partner. So it does a bunch of sideband handshakes. We'll go over one example of that. 
in the next slide for CXL um, to figure out, you know, what is its capability, what is the remote link partner's capability, and then pick an intersection of that for for operating the LinkedIn. And uh, effectively, that's what's happening in the stage three box here. Now, once that's done, we know everything about the operation configuration of the link, and main band flip transfers can begin after that. Um, and, and at that point, you know, the protocol layer can start sending flits, and the adapter is going to insert the CRC and flit header and all of those things and begin normal link operation. But until that point, the protocol layer is still waiting um, for the entire negotiation flow to, to wrap up. And uh, so that's sort of like a, you know, example of a cold boot link bring up, if you will, um, from a UCI layer perspective. So since we're covering um, you know, details about the adapter, thought I'll give an example of the parameter exchanges. Now these exchanges are very similar to what CXL defines in terms of a notion of a downstream port and an upstream port. The downstream port advertises its capabilities. The upstream port looks at that advertised capability, is allowed to configure itself, and then advertises capabilities to the downstream port. And then the downstream port looks at the intersection of that and tells the upstream port, hey, this is what we're going to operate as. So there's specific parameters related to the protocol. You know, are you using all three cxl.io.cache.mem, or are you just using cxl.io and .mem, or are you just doing, you know, .io? Those kind of things are, uh, ha have to be negotiated in the CXL context. But in the case of uh, UCI data to link, we also have multiple flit formats. So for CXL, we had a bunch of flit formats for the CXL 256 byte flit mode. And you also want to know whether it's you know, operating as 256 byte mode or 68 byte flit mode. So all of those things are negotiated using dedicated sideband messages. So what happens is that we start with the downstream port sending its capabilities to the adapter um, as an advertised capability message. The upstream port can look at that message, configure itself, and respond with its set of capabilities that it support. And then um, the downstream port determines that these are my final capabilities I'm going to operate in. And it uh, uh, sort of tells the upstream port this is a final configuration. Now, once they determine that they are CXL protocol, they'll do an additional negotiation for CXL capabilities. So this is where it's like, you know, where, whether I'm operating as .io, .cache, .mem, or all three, those are um, done independently in the protocol-specific handshake related to CXL. All right, so I quickly want to cover at least a brief overview of the physical layer. So I'm going to sort of rush through the power management entry flow. Um, the one thing that I'm going to mention that's important here is that as we are talking about the state machine hierarchy, the power management entry and exit ends up being hierarchical as well. And so when you're going to a deeper power state like L1 or L2, you want the protocol layers to be in the power management state. So in the case of CXL, that would correspond to the RMUX link state machines. Then you want the adapters to go into the corresponding power state. And then finally, you want the physical layer to go into the corresponding power state. So the VLSM handshakes would be through ALMPs, but then the adapter and the physical layer handshakes would be through sideband. And so that's sort of the progression of getting into a power management state. And then the exit is in the reverse order. So the physical layer would exit power management state first, then the adapter, and then the VLSNs. All right, so quickly in two, three minutes, um, we'll cover the log five functions. Like I mentioned, you know, it's responsible for doing specific byte to lane mapping, as well as uh, transmitting data over the lanes. We have a separate valid lane that's used to frame uh, the data transfer. And like I mentioned, we send one byte at a time uh, across every lane. And then there's interconnect redundancy uh, for advanced package configurations. For standard package, we do with, degrada with, with degradation if there is a lane failure. Scrambling and training pattern generation is responsibility of the physical layer. Scrambling is always on. Um, and then we support lane reversal. And of course, all of the 
flows related to link initialization training, as well as power management transitions. And so, you know, even transmitting and receiving specific sideband messages is something that the physical layer uh, takes care of. So this is a brief overview of the, of the link training state machine, just to give you an idea of the different states involved. We won't be diving deep into each. Um, you know, several of them have certain substates to do specific functionality like lane reversal and, and things like that. But effectively, you start from a reset state. Um, like I mentioned, the first part of it is just making sure sideband's functional, that's sideband initialization. Once that's ready, we do mainband initialization, and that's always at the lowest main band speed of four gigatransfers per second. Um, we expect, you know, that's like a, a basic speed that most implementations are supposed to run at, so we do basic initialization at that. And then we do further detailed training for the higher speeds uh, in the MB train state. Um, and, and, you know, that's where you're trying to see if your lanes are working at speed, and that could result in additional repair or degrade transitions if you see at lane, uh, at speed lane failures. Once you're confident that your main band is operating at the desired uh, link speed, uh, we enter a intermediate transitionary state of link initialization or link init. And that's basically just to handshake to bring the RDI state machine to active. And that's where the adapter comes to know that the physical layer is ready uh, for main band transfer and it can begin its, its flows. And uh, after that, we get into active. From active, you can go to a low power state, uh, which is L1 or L2. We've given a common state in the physical layer for simplicity. Um, of course, from L1, the exit will be through uh, retraining the link, but from L2, it goes back to link reset, which is following a similar analogy with PCIe, where you know the L2 exit goes to detect, uh, whereas L1 just goes through retrain. For um, runtime link errors, uh, it may be necessary to retrain the link in certain scenarios. So we've provisioned for a fire retrain state. So if the active state determines like a valid framing error or too many CRC errors, it can trigger a retrain uh, transition, go through the link training once again, see if there's additional repair or degradation needed, and then come back to active. And then for error escalation, um, you know, fatal errors that bring the link down, we have a dedicated train error state that gets escalated to the upper layers as, as an error state. And, you know, software can come in and do required error handling when you're in that state. And then finally, um, the one thing I want to mention about the multi-module support is that, you know, they've been already covered that we have two flavors, both for standard and for advanced. Um, the interesting thing from a physical layer perspective is that we've kept the link training per module to be independent. So each of these modules uh, train their lanes independently. However, there is a synchronization required, uh, which is performed by the multi-module file logic to make sure that all modules train up to the same speed and same width so that the byte to lane mapping is kept consistent from a receiver's perspective. So each of these modules will do their own sideband handshakes with the remote link partner's module. But once they reach you know, the relevant state, where they know what's the top speed they can operate at, the multi-module file logic does the coordination to say, hey, one of my modules can operate at 16, but the other one can only operate at 12, so I'm gonna force everybody to come down to 12, so that I have all modules running at the same speed and same width. And then, because there's multiple modules that are being um, operated, the multi-module file logic is also going to do the byte to lane mapping to make sure that the receiver receives the bytes at the correct, uh, Framing, so you know, module zero, lane zero receives byte zero, and so on and so forth. So that that was the last slide I had. Thanks.